better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. The Animation Podcast is here. Yes, a weekly podcast about all things animation brought to you by Filmbook. Now, my name is Matt Brunet, but some of you may know me as Animat from my YouTube channel, Electric Dragon 505 home of web series that are all about animation, including Animation Look Back and Animat's Reviews. If this is your first time here in the Animation Podcast, we got a whole bunch of holly jolly news for you. Well, maybe some of them aren't as holly or jolly, but we got some very interesting news for you in this episode that does relate to animation. Like, in this episode, we're going to start things off about the craziness of T.J. Miller and his questionable career in the future. Then afterwards, we will be looking at another project in which Louis C.K. is completely removed from. Then we'll be, we shall be talking a little bit about the plot of Teen Titans Go! And then we're going to be jumping into Disney and how there could be a chance we will have an LGBTQ plus princess coming up. And then finally, we will end things off with Animat's Pick of the Week. If you want to check out more episodes of the Animation Podcast, then all you have to do is head on down to Filmbook, which is film-book.com, by searching the Animation Podcast. You can also email us at podcast at filmbook.com with the Animation Podcast in the subject line. And for our first story right over here, I am going to give you something that we just simply cannot get enough of. I'm sure there are millions of reasons for it, but it's always nice to go and have an additional one to really validate this fact. And that is an additional reason why everybody should hate the Emoji Movie. Considering that we are at the end of the year and the Emoji Movie is already popping up in everybody's worst movies of 2017 list. Now, it seems that right now there could be an additional reason why not nobody should like this film and why it should be revolted. And honestly, this is actually something that is beyond Sony Animation's control. This is not something that they've done. But it's actually the fact that it stars T.J. Miller. And the things that have been revealed about him... Oh boy, let's just say he'll actually end up being more hateable than James Corden's acting. Because apparently, uh, there was a film critic out there and a transgender woman by the name of Danielle Solzman. And why do I bring up that she is a transgender woman? Oh, well, uh, you will see soon enough. But apparently, way back at the end of September this year, she actually received an email from T.J. Miller himself that was pretty much a flat-out transphobic attack. Like, this was flat-out attacking her for her identity, basically. And the reason that it happened, or the reason in terms of the timing that it happened, is that She actually received this email sometime a little bit after she posted her review of the Emoji Movie. And like any normal functioning human being, she absolutely hates it and gave it a negative review. And then here comes T.J. Miller right out of the blue saying all these personal attacks on this individual critic. Now, this is not really about anybody... Uh, doing an Emoji Movie review. Like, T.J. Miller wasn't handing out, like, personal attacks to everybody that said a bad thing about the Emoji Movie. I should know. I should have probably gotten one at this point. But T.J. Miller just specifically went all out on this person. But the interesting thing is that when she revealed that email at the end of September, she didn't reveal that it actually was T.J. Miller. And she kept it anonymous for a while, mainly because, well, you know, she was just uh, a little bit scared that she might be faced with legal actions and stuff like that. But then this week, everything pretty much changed when T.J. Miller was revealed to be the new person to be involved with a sexual harassment scandal. And this was actually revealed this week by the Daily Beast. And what he has done, 
Let me just say right now that the actions that he did to some women, they are legitimately worse than anything that I have reported. Like what TJ Miller did is worse than anything that John Lasseter did, is worse than what Louis C.K. did, and even worse than what Chris Savino did. Because not only did TJ Miller sexually assaulted a woman, but he also choked on her, well he was choking her, and he ended up punching her in the face. So this is just one step away from borderline raping the woman. And it's not just that either. TJ Miller actually does have a history among the comedy community a little bit similar to Louis C.K., where he is known a little bit as a creep. Where if you would hang out with him a little too long and you're a woman, then chances are he will be making some lewd comments and you might end up getting groped. In fact, there was a recent report that there was a porn star uh, by the name of Dana, uh, Dana de Arnman who revealed that T.J. Miller actually sexually harassed her along with director Jordan Vaught Roberts when they were when they were filming for the Comedy Central show Mashup. So she pretty much revealed her story about her bad encounter with T.J. Miller. So ever since that report from the Daily Beast came up, he was pretty much the next contestant to be seen as the bad guy, the sexual predator. And unlike most others that they would be more open about it, TJ Miller is trying to fight back. He's trying to say that these allegations are actually not true. Now, TJ Miller has yet to fully face consequences, but there have been some that did occur where he had a Comedy Central series that got canceled just after these allegations got brought up. And as for the email right over here that was sent to Daniel Soulsman, oh boy, let me just tell you that it's actually pretty messed up. And I'm actually going to read you this email coming from Daniel Soulsman's Twitter account. And I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a warning right now. I will try to censor some of the more extreme vulgar words, but... I'm going to still keep some of it right there, so I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a warning that the following may contain some foul language, so uh, listener's discretion is advised. And I'm sure some people right now, they might be getting a little bit too excited. They might go like, oh my god, animate my swear, oh my god, I gotta listen to this, okay. But anyways, um, here is the email that TJ Miller has sent to Danielle Soulsman. So here it goes. <clears throat> so it says right over here, for how long have I supported your strange mass emails, your consistent faltering pursuits of some sort of meaning, giving you only kindness and support. And then you take on this new sort of something, which both, well, the name has been blurred and the rest of her, the rest of us have encouraged. You have merely confirmed what I always knew. This pursuit of transgender identity is nothing more than an opportunity for you to distinguish yourself as someone who is special, but what is really special is how retarded it is that you would even think to attack me or say that I've been offensive. Didn't you used to think you were trying to be some sort of comedian? Didn't you look towards the, com the comedy and improvisation community for support? And now me, one of the only people who would respond, support, and speak highly of you. You threw me shade, you called me offensive, never contact me again, you weird, strange, terrible man. If you were bothered to look into anything that I've ever done, you would find that not only I, have I had sex with transgender people, but I have donated widely to organizations that support their freedom. They're like every other human being is consistently persecuted, meant to feel lonely and attacked for their offenses to nature. You're just joining the ranks and pretending to be offended and suddenly finding support uh, only to freaking turn on me. How is that progressive? You're not a transgender. You're not a tranny. 
You're an effing asshole, Daniel. An effing asshole. Don't respond to this. Don't ever contact me again. And don't think that just because you're you adopt you're adopted something, that that thing allows you to then be rude and incorrect about your friends. Well, those who used to be your friends. Wow, what a freaking jerk. For so long, I feel pity for you, felt sorry for you, and looked for ways that I could support you. You deserve a chance and understanding as much as any other human being. Well, 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 look at what you did, you little, you're little now. You're, you're, you always wanted to be little to be a victim. Well, you are now. You're little to nothing to me at least. Goodbye and remove me from all email lists that no one wants to receive. Your former friend TJ. P.S. Good luck in all your endeavors. I hope you find a way to stop pushing people away and start owning up to the fact that you have had some small part in it by Daniel. Like, I, I, you might probably notice that when I'm reading the email, like, I just feel uncomfortable. And I'm just only thinking throughout this whole email, like reading this, what the hell is wrong with TJ Miller? Okay, like, let me just go ahead and just take a moment to talk a little bit about the sexual allegation thing. Like, let's just say right now that the sexual assault and all those accusations, let's say they're not true. Like, TJ Miller is completely innocent from that. But, read, like, this email that he sent, however, this is not okay. Like, maybe he's not, uh, like, maybe he's not completely transphobic. He's not transphobic in the way, like, Donald Trump and all his idiotic supporters that think it's a good idea to ban transgender people in the military. But this is just absolutely messed up. And the way that he would word his things, it's just, honestly, it's just, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Like, he would say that, oh, I support transgender people, but the way that he would say it, like, the first thing that he would bring up onto how he would support them is that he actually had sex with transgender people. Why would that be the first thing that you would bring up and not the fact that you would donate to organizations that support transgender people? And honestly, the thing is, is that you could tell in this email right over here that this is full on personal. This is not just the fact that he found a negative review on the Emoji Movie. Like, from the sound of it, it sounds like he would expect that this person would be defending the Emoji Movie, and he would be def- uh, that, I am- Oh, Jesus, balls. Oh, I'm- I apologize. I think I'm using the wrong words. That- That TJ Miller is expecting that she would be defending the Emoji Movie. That she would be- helping out TJ Miller, trying to give him a positive image in the Emoji Movie. But, like I said, like any other normal functioning human being, she hates it and she gave it a negative review. And there's nothing really good to be said about the Emoji Movie. Even TJ Miller's performance, it's just lazy. Like, you could tell he just doesn't give a crap. And, like, he just went all out. Like, maybe he's not transphobic, but he certainly is a bigot. Like he's using her like he's using her transgender identity as a weapon to go and attack her with. And that is just flat out wrong. That's what pretty much makes him a bigot. And you know what's actually very interesting about TJ Miller is the fact that one of the news actually did broke out that TJ Miller has been accused of sexual harassment. I was, I was honestly quite surprised to find that there are very few people out there that were legitimately shocked. Because when you look at TJ Miller's activities in this year, you might notice that he has been acting quite strange. Not just in the ways that he would promote the Emoji Movie and that he would agree to star in the Emoji Movie or... I mean, like, yeah, some people could even argue that he would kind of have problems for agreeing to star in a Sony animation movie in the first place. But, like, you notice that the way that he would he would make comments and stuff like that, 
a lot of it is just wrong. Like, he would make some sexist comments, he would make some bigoted comments, and he would say some weird things, and his actions are a little bit unusual, and especially the way that he handled uh, being ousted from Silicon Valley. Like, that moment was pretty big news, and he was just going flat out ballistic. Like, you could tell that he was not handling it well, that he had to get out of Silicon Valley. So you could tell that this is a guy who's probably not okay in the head. And this email right over here pretty much proves it that he would just go in an all-out attack on this person because he felt offended that this person would not be on his side over the Emoji Movie. And it's flat out ridiculous. Now, there are some people out there listening to this, they might be wondering about the fate of T.J. Miller. Now, even though it is a little bit questionable about his future and his career of what's to come, like, we don't fully know if it would be possible that it's just flat out dead, that T.J. Miller is now the next Louis C.K. or Kevin Spacey, and that he would no longer be working in the comedy industry or in the movie industry or anything like that, or if it would just continue. Well, honestly, it is a little bit questionable. Like, you could see that there are a bit of consequences happening. Like I said before, Comedy Central did cancel one of his TV shows uh, right after the sexual allegations or that Daily Beast article was actually released. But I think, ultimately... The fate of T.J. Miller's career would be now in the hands of 20th Century Fox. Because the next big movie that T.J. Miller will be appearing in is in Deadpool 2. And there could actually be a possibility that maybe 20th Century Fox could do something in the veins of all the money in the world. Where they would just flat out completely replace T.J. Miller with another actor to play that specific character. And if that ever does happen, then I think that could be a signal to everyone else in the film, in the Hollywood industry that T.J. Miller is too toxic to work with and you should pretty much abandon ship when it comes to him. So that could probably be the case. So it, it's going to be all up to 20th Century Fox. And I know that it would seem a little bit of a big deal to remove him completely since he is a little bit of a big secondary character in the Deadpool movie and could play a big part in Deadpool 2 as well. But considering that we are talking about Deadpool, I'm sure that they could find numerous of ways to really put a spin on it and have the Merc with the Mouth make some kind of uh, funny commentary about replacing T.J. Miller with someone else saying that, oh, well, we can't really have a rapist. I just want to protect Domino's safety, you know? So I'm just going to have this new guy play this, uh, you know, play my buddy right over here. You know, just make a, a funny comment like that. There could be a possibility, but that's at least the way that I think could happen that can really screw over T.J. Miller's career at this point. But I will say that, yeah, overall... Um, T.J. Miller's career is really on the line, and his image right now is in jeopardy, especially with this email right over here. The fact that it feels like he just could not handle criticism whatsoever, even if it's something as horrible as the Emoji Movie, where it's unanimous to say that it's a terrible film and that T.J. Miller did a bad job right over there, that... T somehow he's just going like he would just go flat out and attack a film critic in this way like going like trying to make it completely personal try to really go out and attack the person's identity instead of just more the comments that this person made on the emoji movie and honestly or maybe like Maybe it's not necessarily about the Emoji Movie, and maybe this could be related to another report, uh, uh, like another movie news report. But still, um, it, again, this is more coincidence and timing that she received this email straight after she released her review of the Emoji Movie, and it is kind of sad because, 
Like, as a film critic myself, I know that this is something that we critics have to deal with all the time. Like, no matter what, we always have to deal with crap like that from people who just can't handle any sort of criticism or who cannot handle any other opinion other than their own, and they would attack all others who have uh, a different opinion other than theirs. And it could be for something like big, or it could be for something as small as a thought on a movie or how they felt regarding a specific feature film. I mean, even with me, I get that all the time on YouTube and on social media where people would flat out hate me or would flat out attack me just because I would say something like Frozen is good or, or that Alpha and Omega is bad. And even with animation studios, some people can't handle listening to a different opinion other than theirs when I would say something like Sony Pictures Animation is bad or that Illumination Entertainment is good. You know, so, there's a lot of crazy people on the internet and they cannot handle listening to an opinion that is different than theirs. But sadly, that is the part of a job as a critic. And sometimes in extreme cases like this, they could try to make it go really personal. And I do feel sorry for Danielle facing through this crazy situation. And I hope that, um, you know, she would go and have her career be better than this. And hopefully she will have better treatment than what TJ Miller has given to her. But yeah, regarding the fate of TJ Miller, it looks like things are going pretty downhill. And uh, well, wouldn't you know it, it looks like uh, the Emoji Movie is not going to be the worst thing to happen to him. Now, our next story right over here, we're actually going to be going into a smooth transition, jumping from one alleged sexual predator to a confirmed sexual predator. And wouldn't you know it, this is actually regarding a project in which TJ Miller was actually involved with. Now, as you may know, TJ Miller has done a lot of voices in some animated projects. Uh, you might know him as Tough Nut from the How to Train Your Dragon franchise. Of course, uh, his most infamous role and probably the worst role he has ever played, Gene from uh, the Emoji Movie. And also, he would play the role of Fred from Big Hero 6. But even in television, he would actually do some animation projects. Most specifically, playing the role of Robbie from Gravity Falls. And this is exactly what I am talking about because... Just recently, Gravity Falls actually made a minor change, but this is just to get rid of another sexual predator, which in this case is actually going to be Louis C.K. The Disney Channel has actually just released some episodes, or just re-airing episodes of Gravity Falls, and now they are actually at the point where they're releasing the final episodes, which are... Uh, the Weird Mageddon Saga, you know, like, uh, Weird Mageddon Part 1, and then I think the second one is Weird Mageddon Part 2, or maybe it's named differently, and then you got the big finale, which is Weird Mageddon Part 3. Now, what they decided to do is that they had Louis C.K. in there making a minor role, like, he appeared in a small part where he would be the voice of a character named the Horrifying Sweaty one Arm Monstrosity. And who this character is, for those of you who have seen it, just to refresh your memory, it's pretty much the giant head of this 40-year-old balding man, and he has an arm coming out of his head, which is his, which is his only way of moving around. And he would try to eat people in a rather passive-aggressive way. Like, he would point people out going like, Hey! Hey, you! Yeah! I need to show you something. Yeah, it's something that you really want. I, I'm sure you really want to come in and get into my mouth. Hey! Hey, what are you doing? Come on! Come on! Don't be running! Don't be like this, man! Come on! You, you need to come into my mouth! Come on! What you doing? What you doing, man? Hey! Come on! Don't be lit! Don't be that, that guy, man! Come on! Come over here! Don't be that guy! You know, he would pretty much play that part. But... As you may probably know about Louis C.K., uh, recently he has admitted to some sexual harassment allegations where he had a reputation 
in the comedy industry where he would bring women onto his dressing room and sometimes he would just be there completely naked or he would just take down his pants and then suddenly they see his penis and in some extreme cases he would just be masturbating in front of them and that's pretty much the whole deal with louis ck and right afterwards his career just went flat out dead like everything got dropped uh a lot of channels like fx are no longer associated with louis ck and um coincidentally enough he actually lost the role of Max for the sequel of the Illumination animated feature, The Secret Life of Pets. Now, what I'm trying to say right over here is that in this case right over here, they pretty much removed Louis C.K.'s voice as the horrifying sweaty one-armed monstrosity. And what they did is that a month ago, they brought in the series creator Alex Hirsch to replace his voice and in my source here in the Hollywood Reporter they actually do have a couple of comparison videos of how Louis CK is voice and then they got the new voice of Alex Hirsch and of course if you guys know Alex Hirsch he's not just the show creator but he has also done numerous of voices in Gravity Falls including the voice of Grunkle Stan and Seuss. And listening to the voices, like sure, maybe Alex Hirsch doesn't sound exactly like Louis C.K., but he is a very talented voice actor to where he definitely got the spirit of the uh, character. And I would say that if I, didn't, if I never knew that Louis C.K. got redubbed, then I would have never known that he actually got replaced because the performance was really good where he really captured the spirit of the character and his passive aggressive nature so it really did work out in the end but honestly it is a little bit of a controversial decision there are some people that are happy that disney channel did take the initiative to actually go and replace louis ck while others think that maybe it's a little bit too much because they understand getting rid of Louis C.K. for upcoming projects. But in this case right over here, this would be like erasing his past. And that might be crossing the line a little bit. And I do understand both sides. Because yeah, technically this is something that Louis C.K. has already done. And this is pretty much trying to uh, sweep something under the rug. Like, Disney Channel doesn't want to fully admit that they collaborated with Louis C.K. on something. So this is pretty much trying to hide the fact that, yeah, they worked on something whom nowadays is considered toxic. But back then is considered a comedic genius. So, yeah, there is a little bit of a side that might not be completely ethical in there. But then again, I do understand why Disney Channel would do something like this, mainly because the role that Louis C.K. played is very minor. In fact, this would just be considered a cameo because they wouldn't do that to any other person. Like, they wouldn't do that to any of their bigger roles. Like, for example, let's just say right now that T.J. Miller actually is someone who did sexually harass these women, that the allegations of the sexual assault and that T.J. Miller actually did choke a woman and punch her also, like, they're all true. Now, in the case right over here with Gravity Falls, Disney Channel would not actually replace T.J. Miller's voice as Robbie because that would be way too much to work on because there are several episodes in which Robbie is actually the main character that Robbie would be a very would play a very prominent role in some episodes and would have a lot of dialogue it would just be a little too expensive and it would take a lot of Disney Channel's time to go and just replace TJ Miller to go and completely eradicate him from the series just to have a new voice it would just be a little too time consuming and it would be a little too expensive just to put in those redubs but in the case right over here louis ck only had very little lines like 
he only had a, a few pieces of dialogue and that's pretty much it like the combining total of uh, of the length of his appearance is probably like just one or two minutes and that's pretty much it so it is an easy quick fate uh, an easy quick fix to just completely remove louis ck bring in alex hirsch to uh redo some of his lines and then go into the editing room and just switch his dialogue and that's pretty much it like this is just something that is very minor and it's just a, a quick fix and considering nowadays that louis ck is a very toxic person right now that nobody would want to be associated with and especially how disney channel and disney xd they want to go and re-air episodes of gravity falls they don't really want to bring back the memory of like oh yeah louis ck was in gravity falls like they don't want to quickly remind people of that so they want to make sure they they just don't want to be associated with louis ck considering his current position is very toxic but i just want to remind you guys though again they're not like disney is not going to do that with everybody who has a bit of a toxic reputation like we're not going to see pixar completely redub the lines of hopper because they don't want kevin spacey to be associated with a bug's life you know they're just doing this because it's an easy quick fix you know just getting rid of a cameo like they can't get rid of a large secondary character like robbie but they can just replace a very quick cameo that that's just easy to do but but yeah it really is quite telling about the consequences of sexual harassment and that you could pretty much be destroyed everywhere like once your reputation is done nobody wants to be associated with you and even the small parts that you have done in the past just to make it a little bit more special yeah they just want to take that away indefinitely so overall yeah it is kind of like a small tidbit but it really is quite interesting how even disney doesn't want to be associated with louis ck Okay, now for our next story right over here and for the rest of the stories, don't worry guys, I am going to lighten the mood now. We're not going to be talking about sexual accusations, we're not going to be talking about sexual harassment, and we're not going to be talking about predators like TJ Miller or Louis C.K. anymore. Now we're just going to be focusing on just the projects themselves. We're just going to be talking about the animated films that we have right over here. And with this one, uh, I think even if you don't like this project, it's definitely a much more positive subject to talk about more so than just the sexual harassers. We're talking about Teen Titans Go! Or more specifically, we're talking about Teen Titans Go! to the movies! Yes, the feature film of the hit Cartoon Network series, Teen Titans Go. And honestly, this was a bit of a last minute decision to include this, but it seems that right now, uh, it looks like Warner Brothers has officially revealed the plot synopsis of what's going to be in Teen Titans Go to the movie. What is going to be the story of Teen Titans Go to the movies? What are the Teen Titans going to do in their big feature film? And well, Coincidentally enough, it's going to be a movie about making a feature film. And it is said right over here, using my source here at CBR.com, it states, it seems to be, oh, it seems to the teens that all major superheroes out there are starring in their own movies. Everyone but the Teen Titans, that is. But de facto leader Robin is determined to remedy the situation and be seen as a star instead of a sidekick. If only they could get the hottest Hollywood film director to notice them. With a few madcap ideas and a song in their heart, the Teen Titans head to Tinseldown, certain to pull off their dream. But when the group is radically misdirected by a serious supervillain and his maniacal plan to take over the Earth, things really go awry. The team finds their friendship and their fighting spirits failing, 
putting the very fate of the Teen Titans themselves on the line. So yeah, overall, this is quite literal. So Teen Titans Go to the Movies is literally about Teen Titans wanting to make a movie. And when hearing the plot, yeah, there are some pitfalls, and you could tell that this might be something that could end up being quite stupid. But looking carefully into this, I can honestly see a lot of directions where this can legitimately work. I can see the ways that Teen Titans go to the movies might actually be pulled off as a pretty good animated comedy. Because here's the thing, of course, a lot of people could say that even with uh, the Teen Titans Go series, they are a little bit more meta. Like, they are pretty much aware with uh, about their own actions. And just recently, I believe for their 200th episode, uh, there was a moment where the Teen Titans themselves would actually hang out with their respective voice actors at one point and have a little bit of that small crossover right over there. But in this case right over here, I can definitely see this work. And one source of inspiration that could actually work out if they can study them well and they could actually get that tone into this is if they follow the same formula as the Muppets. Rather it be something like the, 20, uh, the 2011 Muppet movie or even if they follow the Muppet movie, then they could actually get something that can work. And on top of that, considering that they are associated with DC, like one way that they could really make themselves stand out and work very well as a comedy is if they can make this a satire to the DC Extended Universe. Now, as you may probably know, the DC Extended Universe is pretty much Warner Brothers' answer to the Marvel Cinematic Universe to go and create their big superhero franchise series that would include superheroes like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and all that kind of stuff. So, if they can pretty much go, like with Teen Titans, that is, if they can go and just poke fun of some of the elements that didn't necessarily work out like just uh make some satire and make a little bit of a commentary on why is it that the dc extended universe didn't work and even also like just do a little bit of a jab to some of the fans as well considering that another infamous aspect about the dc extended universe is that there there are some crazy defenders like, they would go and completely attack and try to destroy Marvel's reputation in order to go and have uh, DC's reputation to look good. Like, they would try to desperately defend movies such as Suicide Squad or Justice League or Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Like, to make sure they are labeled as, like, these amazing feature films and that Marvel is nothing but has-beens. So if they can be, if they can make an entire satire and just poke fun at that while trying to go and make a little comedy adventure about making a movie, then it could probably work. And also, at, like, I, like I've said before about Teen Titans Go to the Movies, is that it does share an air to the Lego Batman movie that it could go in that similar route. So not just the Muppets that they should look for in influence, but also to go and take a look at the Lego Batman movie to see what elements in there that actually worked both as a satire and an homage to these DC comics. And I'm sure there are plenty of ways that it can work. So at least in terms of the ideas that they are presenting, I actually do see more ways that this movie can succeed than to fail. But then again, the only thing that we don't have right now is the execution. We don't see how this could be. And the only way that we'll figure out is when the trailer is actually going to be released. But so far... In terms of all the different ideas that they are showing from the plot synopsis and also having celebrities in there like Kristen Bell and even Will Arnett, you, we gotta face the fact, guys, that there is a possibility that Teen Titans go to the movies or Teen Titans... Yeah, I think that's that's what it... Yeah, 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 that's what it's called. Okay, I, I was wondering, it's like, is it go to the movie or go to the movies? Okay, no, but we gotta face the fact that there is a strong chance 
that Teen Titans Go to the Movies might actually turn out to be a fun film. It might turn out to be quite good. But we'll just have to wait and see in how the Teen Titans will be in the big screen on July 27th, 2018. Okay, so for our next story right over here, we are going to be going to Disney. And this week, Disney has suggested an idea that they are considering that is basically freaking people out. Like, there are so many people out there that are getting so excited about this. In fact, there are some that would demand this yesterday. And this actually came from directors Ron Clements and John Musker, whom may I say that this week, from the uh, Art Directors Guild, they are receiving the 2018 William Cameron Menzies Award, so may I just say congratulations to those two. And I'm sure if you guys are listening to this, then you know very well who John Musker and Ron Clements are. These are the legendary directing duo that has brought us movies, including The Great Mouse Detective, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Hercules, uh, Tre Treasure Planet, The Princess and the Frog, and just recently, Moana. Like, these guys are directing legends at Disney, and they are Disney legends in their own right. However, when being interviewed by the Huffington Post, they actually brought up an idea that could be quite interesting. That there could be a chance we would see this happen. Now, of course, they would talk about Moana and some of the innovations that they have done in terms of the animation and how they crafted Moana herself as a fully fleshed out female, a strong female protagonist. And then they would bring up the idea that maybe, just maybe, Disney could create their first ever LGBTQ plus princess. When John Musker and Ron Clements, when they would make their comments, uh, reading from my source here in the Huffington Post, they would say that it seems like the possibilities are pretty open at this point. It would be driven by a director or a directorial team that really wanted to push that and if Disney Animation's chief creative officer, John Lasseter, liked the idea, but I would say we haven't really had restrictions placed on what we have done. So basically what they're saying is that at Disney, they are pretty open to the idea of creating an animated feature that would store an LGBTQ plus princess. Now, the idea in general of having this princess from the LGBTQ community, like, this is not the first time. And in fact, there have been many people who have been demanding this for years. In fact, uh, a while ago, there's been a petition out there where people really wanted to have Elsa from Frozen to be an LGBTQ person, and that maybe for the sequel in Frozen 2, that she would get a girlfriend. Like, that was the big petition that they wanted to have. And I remember that, if I could be very honest, I wasn't really for this idea. Not because I'm against the LGBTQ plus community or anything like that. I'm definitely all for it. It's just that I just find that it would cause more harm than good to go and take an already popular and fully established Disney character and just make them a part of the LGBTQ plus community. You know, that would be like making Mickey, that would be like making either Mickey Mouse or Tinkerbell gay, you know, just to have that representative right over there. But honestly, I just feel like with Elsa's popularity at this point, it would just feel way too sudden, you know, it would just feel like it would be way too controversial and it would cause more harm and damage Disney's reputation and even uh, the image of the whole Frozen brand in general. So yeah, maybe it's not the best idea to do it with an already existing character. However, if they would do it 
by creating a brand new Disney princess to go and create a whole new representative of the LGBTQ plus community that would also be among the Disney princesses, I would only have three words to say about that. Hell yeah, boy! I mean, seriously, that is definitely one of those things that feel like what took them so long. And honestly, I am definitely for this idea because right now, Disney actually is in that perfect position to go and create a story like this. Because there are two reasons, in fact, that I want to point out. Number one is actually how Disney is pretty much back to their glory days or how they're back telling classic fairy tales. Now, we have recently seen movies such as Tangled or Frozen or even Moana that still stick to that Disney formula and some of them are based on a classic fairy tale and would be given a new spin to give that Disney treatment to them and they have found massive success and they would give us such amazing movies with them like I said like with films like The Princess and the Frog with uh, Tangled with Frozen and with Moana so they can make so they definitely are in a position where they could take a classic fairy tale and they can go and create an amazing animated feature with it but it's not just that however the second reason why they're pretty much armed and ready to go ahead and do so very well is actually because Disney is now capable of tackling serious subject matter. And with that, I mean with Zootopia. They have proven to themselves that they can go in a very serious and adult subject matter like uh, discussing, like putting in a commentary on discrimination and bigotry onto a family-friendly animated feature. And to go into a serious and uh, controversial subject matter like uh, the LGBTQ plus community, they would actually go and put that in there to go and, um, you know, they could actually tell a great story with that commentary. That's basically the whole thing that I want to say. So with those two reasons, not only... Are they capable of crafting uh, an LGBTQ plus princess, but they can make a great movie around that. However, there is one uh, factor that I saw that John Musker and Ron Clemens brought up is that now Disney would just need to go and find a director or a directorial team that would be capable of doing this. Now, I know that there are some people that would say, oh, why not bring, bring in Byron Howard to do this? You know, since, he, like, that guy is actually gay himself, so, like, he would be the perfect, he would be the perfect director to make uh, a princess from the LGBTQ community. But I actually do have two people that are, that in my mind, would actually be perfect for this job, considering the amount of progressiveness that they added to Disney. I mean, since it is brought up by John Musker and Ron Clements, why not they direct it? I mean, seriously, think about it. When you think about their involvement with what they added to, to uh, the Disney princesses, these are the guys who actually put in the most, well, not put in the most diversity, but they really did play a key factor and added in a lot of diversity among the Disney princesses. Keep in mind, these are the guys who are the first people, ever, like, these are the first guys ever to add in the first Disney princess who is a person of color with Jasmine from Aladdin, and they were the, they were the ones who contributed to adding Tiana, the first African-American princess from The Princess and the Frog, to be a part of the Disney princess team. And then you got, th like, why not this? I'm sure that these guys are capable enough to go and take a princess that would be a part of the LGBTQ plus community and to go and put them in a great Disney film. Because I think that would be the most important thing right over here. It's not just the fact to create, oh, let's go and create an LGBTQ princess. That's not the big goal. It should be, let's make a great movie with an LGBTQ princess. 
Now, I am pretty certain that, of course, with stuff like this, uh, there would be some consequences as well. It will spark some controversy no matter what, since sadly, we still we do still live in an age where there are a lot of bigoted people who are against the LGBTQ plus community, that they would absolutely hate anything that would even have just a little drop of LGBTQ love right over there. Like, even if they just see the slightest hint of it, they would absolutely throw in a massive temper tantrum and make a complete rant about it online. Like, that will happen. But as long as the movie can be great, then it shouldn't be a problem, honestly. Like, those complaints and those little whining from idiotic bigots, like, that's just going to be a, a wind in the breeze. It will just pass on, and people will just enjoy and love this movie. I mean, it's a little bit like what's happening uh, as I'm recording this with Star Wars The Last Jedi. Yes, there are a lot of whiny fanboys that hate Star Wars The Last Jedi with a passion, but that's going to breeze away eventually, and people will remember The Last Jedi as an amazing addition to the Star Wars saga. And that could be the thing here as well. But yeah, overall, I will say that I am fully in support if Disney does create a new Disney princess that would be a part of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, that would be a great idea, even though as I'm recording this, it won't happen for a long time, like chances are. We would only be seeing this sometime in the, maybe the middle of the 2020 decade, who knows. But yeah, this idea, like, I'm fully forward with it. Let's see what happens with it. And so finally, we shall now go and end things off with Animat's pick of the week. And for this week, I would like to talk about one of the most important animated features because this film actually had a big anniversary this week. And for that, I want to bring you guys back in time to go a little bit back to the past, or majorly back to the past in this case, on December 21st, 1937, in Los Angeles, California, and probably one of the most exciting and stressful days for Walt Disney and his crew, where they would enter upon the Carthy Circle Theater and watch the premiere of their first ever animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And ever since then, 80, now here we are 80 years later, and my God, the impact that this movie has done, it is huge. And this is what I want to talk about. For the 80th anniversary of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, let's just go ahead and just take a moment to look back at the achievements that this movie has done. Its history and the impact that it has made, not just in the animation industry, but also in cinema in general, and also in our modern society, in our culture. Because many people would even say that this is one of the most important movies ever created. And not, not just one of the most important animated films, but just one of the most important, period. And the interesting thing about Snow White is that if you're a fan of either Disney or of animation, then you know the story about the making of Snow White. Not just the story of Snow White itself, but also what went behind the scenes, because that's an epic tale in itself, one of which that I'm actually quite surprised that it has yet to actually be made into its own feature film. Like, we have already gotten Walt before Mickey, and we have already gotten Saving Mr. Banks about the making of Mary Poppins, but the story about the making of Snow White, it's a very famous one, and it really is a story of determination and dedication to a passion project that would forever change history as we know it. Because the whole thing is that Walt Disney was so passionate to go and create a feature film 
with his animation team. And you got to keep in mind, back then, sure, it's not the first time ever that there was an animated feature film. But in Hollywood, this was an idea that was never heard of. Back then, they only think about cartoons as just something that people just want to go and they would make people laugh. It's just like a short little funny thing that would last for like 7 to 10 minutes. And back then, the only stars, like, there there really wasn't many. Of course, you would have Mickey Mouse, but there was also people like Fritz the, uh, Fritz the Cat. <laughs> Sorry, nope, wrong one. Uh, there was also Felix the Cat. There was uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. There was um, Daffy Duck. There was Porky Pig. I mean, this was a time not even Bugs Bunny was created. Or, I actually, it was even... I, I'm not even sure if Daffy Duck was even created at the time. I know Porky was. But Daffy... Uh, da Daffy? Uh, I don't really know. But, anyways, going back into Snow White, Walt Disney really wanted to make this into a feature film. And back then, everybody looked at him like he was crazy. Like, who would be willing to sit through about 80 or 90 minutes worth of... Of an entire cartoon. People would just go nuts. And surprisingly enough. Not many people actually had fate in this film. They they really didn't. Back then. A lot of news reports. Were actually calling it Disney's folly. Because the idea of making a feature length cartoon. It was just absolutely nuts. But Walt Disney was certainly determined to go and create this. And not just create this. But to make it good to really amaze audiences with it to bring animation into directions that has never been seen before or at least never been seen in hollywood and in north america because what walt the, the biggest mission that walt disney wanted to do with this is to not only make people laugh with it but also to make people cry with it now i will get back to this a little bit later but that was kind of the big goal. Walt Disney wants to make sure that audiences to, can actually connect themselves emotionally with the characters that they see in the feature. That they would believe that characters like Snow White, Doc, Dopey, and all the other dwarves, that they would believe them as actual people as much as a live-action actor. And they really would. And not, not only that, but they want to go into directions in the animation in itself that they have never done before. And beforehand, they would actually release some experiments. They, they would create some animated shorts in the Silly Symphonies that would determine if they can actually do it or not. And they, they tried to do some tests, and it's a little bit of a mixed result. There were some that went well, and there are some that didn't. There are some like the old mill where they really want to test out the multi-plane camera system that turned out beautifully. Like the multi, like here's the thing. The multi-plane camera has been regarded as one of the most innovative things ever created in the history of animation to give us some amazing and beautiful shots. And then there are experiments like the Goddess of Spring where they want to try to break out of that Mickey Mouse rubber hose style and create a more realistic and more natural moving character with the Goddess of Spring as an example. And the result in that animated short, it, it did not look good. I, I can tell you that. It's just, you look at that and, uh, yeah, no, it just... That's a nope right over there. Like, the short... Yeah, say what you will about the short, but the animation, for what they're trying to do, uh... <laughs> that did not look good at all. <laughs> now, of course, I mean, luckily, they did fix it up, and they tried to improve their craft when it came to the movie itself, but... Yeah, they really did want to go up and beyond with this project. They really want to make sure... They want to create an achievement far greater than anything that they have done in the past. Far greater than Mickey Mouse. Far greater than Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Far greater than the Skeleton Dance. Far greater than Flowers and Trees. They want to make this the biggest thing ever. I mean, this is literally the biggest thing that they have ever created 
at the time. And with the emotional thing, now that was really the ultimate test of Snow White. It, it, was, it wasn't just the test for this movie in general. It is a test for all animated features to come to see if people can really if if it really is possible that audiences can connect themselves emotionally with the characters in this movie and the most important scene of snow white and the seven dwarves now of course there are a lot of memorable ones like hi ho and then the silly song and uh snow white singing someday my prince will come but the most important one that changed everything for animation forever it was actually the scene right after Snow White bit the apple and she went into her eternal slumber and then the dwarves would actually go and chase off the Wicked Witch and then she fell and got crushed by a rock. The most important scene, it was after that. When the, fu the organ funeral music was playing and you see all the animals gathering uh, outside of the house, outside of the cottage, and you see the dwarves inside looking at... Uh, Snow White's dead body and you see them just they didn't say anything they're just in tears and that's all you see them do you just see them cry weep, mope, sob and grief for what they believe to be the death of Snow White someone that they've cared about that they took care of the, the, the person that they saw as a mother figure that they just lost her and that she's just gone and you see everybody is just sad about it even grumpy whom for the longest time tries to act tough like he had to be in his corner and he had to cry on his own like he's there's still a part of him that's just sad that well it's just a part of him that doesn't want to be seen with the others just crying that he feels devastated over the death of snow white and that was the key moment to really show that if audiences can do the opposite of laughing at like silly cartoons, if they can cry at a cartoon and everybody and right at the theater at that premiere on December 21st, 1937, when they heard all the biggest stars, like all the people watching this, when they were sobbing as much as the dwarves were, that's when the animators that's when Walt and that's when the entire crew of Snow White knew that they looked back and they saw the crying people and they knew in their heads, oh my God, we did it. We actually succeeded in making an animated feature. And from then on, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves has been known as a masterpiece, basically, because it worked. It was something that nobody has ever seen at the time, and it was an amazing achievement. And it paid off extremely well for Walt Disney and his team to later go on and create an entire legacy of animated features. And it would later go on to create plenty of other animated films to really change, the, the, to pretty much change cinema as we know it today. And to really make this entire legacy all based on Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And I mean, this is why you would always see advertisings that would say the one that started it all. Because this is the one that really burst Disney's popularity that like if it, if it wasn't Mickey Mouse, then it's certainly Snow White and the Seven Dwarves that really made Disney the giant empire that we know today. That, that animation nowadays is a legitimate film medium in cinema. That animation is as huge as it is. It is all thanks to Snow White. I mean, if that thing failed, then animation would pretty much be dead nowadays that like people would just still be making silly little cartoons and that's it like they wouldn't be serious about it and i think that's the real beauty of snow white and the seven dwarves that this is the movie that really did prove to the world that animation can be a legitimate medium to create movies with and say i mean say what you will 
about the movie itself. I know that nowadays there are a lot of people out there, they wouldn't say that Snow White on its own is the best animated feature of all time. Like, even though some would say, you know, some would say that, but that is for different reasons. Like, the movie itself, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things in there that have been done, uh, like, in future films way better than this. But the reason why nowadays people would consider Snow White as one of the most important as, and also one of the greatest animated features of all time is because of its influence, of the legacy that it left behind, of the living proof that animation can be a legitimate film medium. That is the reason why we look back at Snow White and Seven Dwarfs as one of the most important movies ever created. And to think that 80 years ago, it was certainly a major life-changing moment that no one would expect this to really happen, that this would be the biggest thing. That the, the, This is something that Walt Disney truly believed in, and he risked everything for it to make sure that Snow White would turn out as great as it is. And here we are right now, and really... This is a film that really changed everything for the for the better. And it's one of the most important projects ever created in animation. So to that, I just want to say I salute Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And it definitely is one of the most important things in animation that we have ever had. So yeah, this definitely is quite an amazing project. And... Yeah, it, it really is such a fascinating. It, it really is such a fascinating movie that it's kind of surprising how this really changed everything. It truly deserves the title of the one that started it all. And that is all that I've got for this week. So let me just say thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Animation Podcast. You can go ahead and find more of my work at film-book.com. All you have to do is search for Matthew Brunette or the Animation Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at Animat505. Now, if you have listened to this podcast on iTunes or any other podcast or uh, anything that, that you can listen to this podcast, do you mind doing us a little favor and uh, rate and review this episode? And if you are listening to this podcast on YouTube, hit that like button in our video and leave us a little comment on your thoughts about the news this week. Tune in next week for the latest episode of the Animation Podcast and all things animation. Let me just say to you guys, thank you guys so much for listening. Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, and so much more. And until next week, see you later, dudes.